Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, just letting folks get settled in here virtually, if you will, before we officially get started. Great to see some familiar names and faces uh, coming in to, uh, to the uh, broadcast today. It's great to see you guys. Sammy, good to see you on. I see Rose has come in and, uh, oh yes, I've seen some familiar names coming in here. It's great to see you guys. Wonderful. I've disabled the weight room, everyone. So uh, if you want to invite somebody in to join us, uh, you send them your, send them the notice and they can come in and uh, they won't get stopped at the weight room door. Uh, Tawanda, good to see you on joining us. And Willamette, great to have you on. Always good to see you joining us for, for, uh, yes. I don't know why I was, everyone, I don't know why I was going out. It, it's going in and out. I don't know why. Well, if you, yeah, maybe if you turn off your video, that might save a little bandwidth for you and keep you on. Okay. Hello, everyone. Well, let's go ahead. Uh, just to stay on time here, we've got a we've got a really wonderful uh, event planned here, and I want to just welcome everyone. My name is Steve Steiny. I'm one of the managers here at the National American Indian Alaska Native ATC. Uh, Willamette, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and mute you just so we don't get background noise. There you go. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I'm one of the managers here at the National American Indian Alaska Native ATC, and uh, hosting today's event. Um, today, today's event is a special three uh, session series, and we're really excited about this. Uh, we've got some fantastic uh, speakers and presenters lined up and even have our special guest, uh, uh, Mr. Jim Weichel is joining us as well. So um, today's session, this is session one of three uh doing healing work in our communities where does the healer go for healing and this is uh, uh i'm going to let abraham talk about the walking in balance uh, uh, curricula and and let him talk more about that uh, as the developer of this uh, <clears throat> this approach uh, in this curricula so uh, this is session one, so we're not going to try and uh, do this all in one shot. We were, we were pretty uh, aware early on that we would have to spread this out over a little time, and and we're just happy to have you all here. And I'll let Abraham talk more about that. I just have a few introductory slides uh, to go through, and then we'll get started. Again, uh, those of you on have joined us before, and you know that this event is brought to you by the National American Indian Alaska Native. Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Uh, we are located at the University of Iowa, and I'm broadcasting to you from the fourth floor at the College of Public Health right here on campus. Uh, we were talking a little bit about weather. It's it's the low 80s here, and I um, might get some rain this afternoon, but so far, so good. We are part of a larger national network made up of 10 regional centers, a national Hispanic and Latinx center, as well as an HTC network coordinating office located at the University of Missouri. This project, as you know, is supported and funded by SAMHSA, and the content uh, is developed by the presenters, and the opinions and topics expressed today do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA HHS or the National American Indian Alaska Native HTC. We uh, will be recording today's event and we'll make links available to uh, to watch this at a later time. We do have a archive of all of our virtual events that we've done over the last several years. Uh, I can make that link available to you all as well if you're interested. Uh, but this will allow you to share uh, this recording with maybe a friend or colleague who wasn't able to join us today. We are going to offer two 
uh, NADAC approved CEUs for today's event. So that'll be contingent upon your Zoom registration and attendance at today's event, as well as uh, our sessions in subsequent weeks. Uh, <clears throat> and then I will also talk to Abraham and Jenny about uh, making slides available or PDF uh, versions of today's uh, information available to everyone as well. Uh, lastly, we are going to ask that you participate in a short survey following today's event. I'll post the link to that short survey in the chat box today. Uh, we'll also include a link and a QR code to this uh, survey in a follow-up email. So we'd love to hear back from you. We've added a couple of short answer uh, questions to the survey so we can hear from you in your own words. But your feedback is really important to us. Plus, it lets our funders know that we are providing events such as this and allows us to continue to do that in the future. So really happy to have you all here and please consider uh, participating in completing that short survey. It's confidential and can't be linked to you in any way. I know we're gathered here virtually today, but we do want to take a few moments before we get started to pay respect to the land and to the indigenous nations whose homelands were forcibly taken and inhabited. Please take a moment to read this land acknowledgement that was created by three former members of our team, Ella and Keeley Driscoll, and uh, Mr. Sean Bear from the Nisquaki and Winnebago Nations, respectively. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce today's speakers. I'm going to let them introduce themselves fully, but I want to introduce uh, our main speakers for today, as well as our our series, uh, our series of three. Uh, first, I want to introduce my new colleague and friend, Mr. Abraham Bearpaw. He is the uh, He's the author of the Walking in Balance uh, uh, Wellness Program, and we're really happy to have him uh, join us today, uh, as well as his, uh, as his colleague, uh, Dr. Jenny Barnes is here with us. Uh, she's also involved in uh, the Walking in Balance curricula, and she is one of our presenters today as well. I'm really happy to have her along with us, and I'm happy to call her my new colleague and friend as well. And of course, uh, our special guest, Mr. Jim Weichel. Uh, Jim and I have been working together uh, for the past three years, uh, doing a lot of virtual events together. Jim is part of our advisory council and a consultant with our center. So really happy to have Jim join us as well. Um, with that, I'm gonna, gonna be quiet here now for a moment. And uh, I wanna turn the floor over to, to Jim to get us started off in a good way and then I will relinquish the floor to Abraham and Jenny to, to get us started on today's presentation. So thanks everybody for being here and I'll turn the floor over now to, to, to Jim. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. I'm gonna say Nyawe Skano Sportwego. Greetings everybody. I'm glad you're all here. I'm grateful for your well-being. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself. I told you my name. Uh, in Kuga, that means his mind is made up. My clan, which is Wolf from my mother's side, and my nation, which is the Seneca Kuga Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, I would say Jim Gazzo. That's what most people call me. That's what I most people know me by. Uh, I am a uh, peer support specialist. I've been in, involved in that work since 2015. I currently work for a tribal uh, organization here up in, in Oregon. I'm in Salem, Oregon. That's where I'm at now. Um, and I'm in long-term recovery. Um, 
I had an awakening about recovery the other day. We talked about recovery, and I think for us indigenous people who are in recovery, recovery means to gain back something that's been lost. And my whole journey of recovery has been that to regain and recover, uh, first of all, who I am as an on with holy person, and also languages, cultures, food ways, medicines, families, uh, waters, all those things that go together to make us who are who we are. And that's to me, that's what recovery for indigenous people is. Um, and um, currently, I, like I said, I live in Salem, Oregon, and that is on the stolen and occupied territory of the Kalapuya peoples who are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron. So I'm going to say what we call the Ganohanyok uh, Thanksgiving speech. I'm going to say it in Cuyuga. Uh, before I do, um, I'm going to learn a little what we call Oyanko Owe. It's just, it's Indian tobacco. And we burn tobacco whenever we say this speech, if we can. And I try to start my day off every day uh, with it because it's about putting on what we call the Gatni Gohayo, the good mind. And uh, you'll hear uh, Abraham and Dr. Barnes talk a lot about the good mind and how gratitude and practicing thankfulness goes into making that good mind. And so basically what I'm gonna do is just acknowledge and give thanks to all the things and parts of the creation that give us life and sustain us life and so forth and so on. So, um, and I'm gonna say it in Gaikono and Kyuga, it's a long version, so I'm not gonna translate into English because it would take too long. But uh, I think if, if, even if you don't know what I'm saying in your head, you will in your heart. So uh, let me let me begin. And I'm going to say, O ne 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 ke kyo de eswata siyo, skywanto, awato, sanguaya di so sangwa, we ganohan yok ne di, e de de wake ya dot, de tutanahonyo, se skeno, de putanahonyo, toni utaho, kapati goha. O ne edrakro we ne, o enzige, donoha, di atinia hokwa, toyego, hotwa we aguego, sen senyo, edwege gaya de gak, ne skeno, edwunanahonyo, one dia tinya honyo guno ha awansi ge toni yuto kwani go ha one etwa tractro e ni oya watso awansi ge kurio kurio e rage toho kat gari da ono vatra gan heko owen hetso one dia tinya honyo oya watso awansi ge toni yuto kwani go ha one etwa tractro e ni had hadi ya hagi Poya Twatso Nege, Goari Guluni, Oji Sodak, One, Dia Tinya Honyo, Ne, Hari, Hari O Yagi, Oyo Twatso, Tony Utoho, Kapat Nikoha, One, Edwatra Troe, Ne, Odi Hadoni, Ne, Goati Gowani, Ne, Oata, Ne, Dia Tinya Honyo, Ne, Odi Hadoni, Ne, Nioto, Kapat Nikoha, One, Edwatra Troe, Ne, Gadino, Owasage, Dia, Dia nido dwai nye ne ni gudi go yanis ne oni galvo ganis ne ge goari goani de wahotis one dia tinya hone gadino toni yuto kwadi goha one edwata troe ni one genos kunigo ni yo de ge o guayu du do gateso one du ya tinya hone one genos kunigo ni yo toni yuto kwadi goha one edwaka troe ni awari ni ge o awari you do do gate so one dia tinya hone one awari tony yuto kwati goha one edwaka troe ni hada wana dog is ne on eganos hada hadi hawis itiso dia tinya hokwa one dia tinya hone uh hada wana dog is tony yuto kwati goha one edwaka troe ni edika gakwa ni ge to hit tito o words again one a deswana na honyo ni adika gakwa tony yuto kwati goha one a ratra troe ni asoho asohika gakwa nege and tiso the atino hokwa ne iwa yago nego exaso o ase todi uhu yogi one a de atino honyo ni asohika gakwa tony yuto kwati goha one a ratra troe ni odiso daja nege aso to 
Diotie, Ode, Gawadi Gohato, One, Di Tinya Honio, Ojiso Daja, Tony Yuto, Vadi Goha. One, Edra Cap Troe, Ne, Gay, Neheno, Diotie Nuto, Ne Gay, Oso, Ton, Oyotie, Poati Hodago, One, Di Tinya Honio, Gay, Neheno, Diakiki Nuto, Tony Yuto, Vadi Goha. One, Edra Cap Troe, Ne, Gawadi Gui, Tanigra, Sangoi Diso, Ne, Oso, so guardi the corner say tosto ho goi hadeo nihoni skeno dwenadonio on a despon and a honio no the songoidi so tony you to hook uh obat ni goha to not got wini ne ganohonyo dana to and I like that last line because basically when the speaker finishes he says that's all that's all and that's all I could think of that's the best I can do and I like that because that's all this Ask of any of us every day. And Dana told me that's all. And I say, Yahweh, thank you. Well, oh, thank you, Jim. I really appreciate that. Appreciate you helping us to get started in a good way. Um, also, thank you, uh, Stephen, for your introduction and uh, for hosting this. Um, we really appreciate all the work that you guys do to. Um, enable these trainings and thank you everybody for joining wherever you are at today all across the country i hope that it's not too hot wherever you are uh, but definitely grateful for this summer season um i guess i just introduced myself uh sioni god um, my name is uh, abraham bearpaw um, i am cherokee and i'm from Tahlequah, oklahoma um, my partner, um, Dr. Barnes, is here as well. Uh, Dr. Barnes, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Thank you. I was on unmute earlier and then changed that. Anyway, <laughs> I'm Dr. Barnes. Um, I'm a psychologist in rural Oklahoma, which is where I've uh, spent most of my life. Uh, went over to OU in Norman and then NSU in Tahlequah and then OSU for school. So I've kind of circled around Oklahoma, but Oklahoma, Arkansas, and a little bit of Texas has been where I've done uh, all of my work. So, but right now I'm focusing on um, working with people, testing and therapy uh, regarding neurodivergence. So things like autism and ADHD and uh, complex PTSD and things of that nature. What oh, Dr. Barnes? Um, so today we're here to talk about where does the healer go for healing, right? And so one part of that that we're really excited to share is the Walking in Balance curriculum. Um, I developed this curriculum a number of years ago, um, you know, and the foundations come from Cherokee, cultural, traditional, and ceremonial ways. I was raised ceremonial, um, ceremonially. I grew up in our stomp grounds and um, our stomp ground is located in Rocky Mountain, Oklahoma. It's the Flint, Flint Rock ceremonial ground. And so growing up, you know, I would hear a lot of stories from uh, my family. You know, of course, in native way, if you ever want to know anything, a lot of times to be like, hey, uncle, can you tell me about this? And you better clear out like 45 minutes out of your schedule because he's, he has a story to tell, right? And so a lot of times you don't just get this quick answer. You know, he would just sit me down and tell me this long story. But that's really awesome because that really helped me remember these teachings. So, you know, um, walking in balance, what that really means is, you know, historically, Cherokee people practiced many positive coping skills that enabled them to walk in balance. Walking in balance means that we find a harmony between our mind, body, spirit, and environment so that we can live well. The walking in balance components are derived from Cherokee cultural teachings that have been passed down since time immemorial. However, the walking in balance program can be tailored to fit your lifestyle. And, you know, this program isn't just tailored to fit your lifestyle, but also to fit your particular tribal teachings your particular cultural teachings. Um, you know, I, I created this program so that it can be adapted um, to everyone. And really, you know, I've lived on a lot of different reservations throughout the country. I've worked for a lot of different tribes. 
And one thing I've found is that, you know, we have different languages, we have different ceremonies, different songs, but our values are the same, you know? And so we're going to talk about a lot of those today. And so uh, my hope is at the end of this training, um, you know, you'll be able to uh, understand how Native cultural teachings and walking and balance components can help us to cope effectively with life's challenges. Um, also, how we can apply these teachings to help build resiliency in our lives. And then last, how to integrate walking and balance components into an individual action plan. So, you know, it's one thing to know these things, and then it's something entirely different to practice these things, right? I mean, I knew all of this stuff from whenever I was, before I could walk, right? I knew about uh, the importance of practicing gratitude, about practicing forgiveness, um, about acceptance, about practicing self-compassion. But I also knew I wanted to be a part of the crowd. I wanted to be accepted by my non-native um, you know, classmates. And so I would go with them and um, you know, do what they did, right? And so, you know, unfortunately, you know, that happens a lot of times. You know, we will go with um, you know, feel pressured to um go with the flow, maybe with um you know, what the dominant society is doing. And so I ended up um, developing some negative, um, you know, coping skills, you know, throughout my life. And um, it also is hard if you are an urban native. I've lived in cities and stuff. It's hard to feel that connection a lot of times. And that's why we created this program so that everybody can feel connected um, wherever they are. So here are the Cherokee traditional teachings. This is what walking in balance consists of. You know, a lot of times people look at native culture and they see feathers and they hear songs and they'll hear language, you know, and of course, a lot of what people learn is on t off of TV. Right. And so, you know, but actually what I was taught and what I believe, you know, to this day is our actual culture, cultural teachings exist as a framework for our wellness. You know, we may be going out and doing a dance, but we're actually practicing gratitude. You know, we're actually practicing respect. We're practicing effective communication. We're practicing service. So, you know, all of these things um, are woven throughout our, our daily living and our cultural teachings. Unfortunately, when we see that, you know, a lot of Natives lost connection with these cultural teachings, we also lost connection with these positive coping skills, with these values. And so, um, and, and, you know, uh, Jim was talking about recovery and what does that mean? You know, it's so awesome to see so many of our young people um, reclaiming their language, reclaiming their cultural ways, reclaiming their health, reclaiming their wellness. You know, the reason I'm coming to you from Oklahoma today is because there was a study come out a few years ago that listed my hometown. Um, I was actually from Stillwell, of uh, Stillwell, Oklahoma, as having the lowest life expectancy in the country. And that just, it, it, it really, um, you know, tore at my heart and um, I wanted to do something about it. And so that's why, um, you know, I wanted to come here and teach this curriculum and help our people return to wellness. Uh, you know, I share a quote by Dr. Barnes a lot. I may overshare it at times. Um, she told me once during a conversation um, that society is garbage. And, you know, I just like, I felt that in my bones. I'm like, you know what? You're right. Like, you know, right now our society, unfortunately, we have so many great people, but we get caught up in worshiping or going after the wrong things, right? We chase money a lot. And of course, I know you have to pay your bills. I have to pay my bills. We got to get it done, right? You know, but unfortunately, our systems and society is not, they're not set up for our wellness. They are set up for us to be productive, right? For, you know, um, people to go to work. And of course that's important, but we want people to be well enough, not just to work, but to thrive, to have energy, to have fulfillment, to love your life, to love what you do, to feel connected. That's the purpose of walking in balance. And so we've broken that down into a series of teachings that can be um, adapted into your existing habits. And so we're not trying to get you to overhaul a bunch of things at once, just make small changes to your existing habits. And I mean, 
the proof is in the pudding. I, I do this myself. I actually created this program because I was new in sobriety. I'm over 10 months. Um, I'm 10 months, a 10 years sober now. Um, it'll be actually um, coming up on my 11th year. Yay me. And so, you know, I, I needed, I, of course, I went to AA and, but there are a lot of people who do not, cannot connect with these, te the teachings of Alcoholics Anonymous or for whatever reason, they may need a supplement to their program. And that's what walking in balance can be. Um, it's not meant to replace any mental health or um, recovery program, but instead it's meant to supplement them. So um, we'll get into it really quick. Um, so here are where are the, those values that I, I just told you about, the components of the program. This is where they actually have come from um, in my life. Um, like I say, they come from our stomp ground, our ceremonial ways, um, you know, the, the games that we play there, our ceremonial games, our ceremonial dances, our spirituality, gathering and making medicine, stickball and other games, um, learning and speaking our language. Also practicing our arts, you know, practicing that mindfulness, storytelling, hunting and gathering and relationships. So traditionally, when we had our villages, you know, this is where our daily living, right? We would just be taught all of these things so that we could live a fulfilled life of wellness and live in balance with our spirit, with everybody in our household, with everybody in our community and with our environment, right? You know, I'm, I, I think it's kind of like a badge of honor that you know, they go through and they try to find these Cherokee settlements, and it's really hard for them to find where we existed. Um, and I think that's because we lived in balance so well, our ancestors did, you could barely even tell we, we were there, right? And so, you know, then that's one part, you know, of walking in balance. We want to leave this earth better than we found it, right? And so, and and I, I like to leave everybody better than I found them, you know, practicing that compassion and empathy, right? So to, just to get into it, um, because I can literally talk for days. So I'm going to um, just get into the curriculum here because I really want to hear from Dr. Barnes um, and also um, Jim's thoughts and also your thoughts on all of this. I want to leave time for the discussion. So the first component of walking in balance is we aspire to be spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, and socially well. God, that's a lot, right? So that first component just kind of, you know, boom, right to your face, right? But, you know, when you think about wellness, there's a lot that's involved in it. And so, you know, like I mentioned before, we didn't even think about these things. We didn't even talk about it. This is just the way that we lived. However, now we live in different systems, right? We live in different educational systems. You know, we have different occupations. We live in different parts of the country, um, have different cultures, right? Urban, rural, native, non-native, um, you know? And so, you know, practicing wellness now, you know, we have to actually be, you know, have that intention. It's not just done for us. We don't have a system necessarily that supports our wellness. Um, in my entire life of going to school, wellness was never mentioned once. Not one time. Um, I think I cried a couple of times at school because I got in fights and, you know, they said, suck it up. I mean, like my no, I got hit in the, with a bat one time playing softball. I had blood going everywhere. And the coach said, suck it up. You know, um, nobody wants to hear you crying, you know, go move it on out of here. Go, you know, get that taken care of. And so like, you know, kids would fall asleep. Kids would, you know, having all these issues, you know, right. Have maybe having a hard home life. And they would, those were just problem kids, right? Those were just lazy kids. Those were just kids who didn't want to get in and fit in with everybody else. But, you know, and so wellness, it was, it's so, you know, it's sad that a, a lot of the kids from my generation, Gen X, what's up? Um, you know, a lot of kids from Gen X, wellness just kind of <laughs> passed over us a little bit. And unless you were a person of means, you know, and your family could access a lot of resources, you would miss out a lot. So anyway, that's a whole different um, conversation. So, um, you know, like I said, but this is really what com comprises our wellness, um, you know, and our ceremonial ways actually address all of these components. So, um, so practicing wellness for me, you know, traditionally, um, you know, I go to the stomp ground for a lot of my wellness. We dance, we sing, 
we play ball. Um, and so, you know, like I said, we would have these traditional ways and, you know, kind of things that are built into our schedules. Now I have to create these things in my own life. And so whether I'm living in the city, whether no matter where I'm at, I can practice these traditional ways and this traditional um, component of wellness. So one way I do it first, just by setting its intention, you know, um, I get to decide how I want to feel, you know, I know you're going to hit traffic. I know people are going to honk at you are going to have some not nice words for you every day. I know you're going to see some different things throughout the day, but really if I decide I want to be grateful today, and if I decide I want to, you know, focus on wellness, then that's what's going to happen for me. Um, I also keep a journal for mental wellness. I practice positive affirmations a lot. I talk about this a lot because they really work. You know, like I said, we were taught as native people to, to think good things about ourselves, to think about good outcomes, to manifest good outcomes for ourselves and our family. That's a, a, a really um, awesome coping skill to have. Um, also practicing mindfulness. And so, you know, these are a lot of different ways of practicing wellness. And so um, you'll hear, you know, this kind of recurring theme throughout the curriculum. Um, but like I said, you know, we can also, though, practice our traditional ways of wellness. So whatever songs you have, whatever dances you guys have, to be able to reconnect with those teachings, um, that's what Walking in Balance is all about. So we put on um, conferences. Um, we actually do train the trainer where we can come to your tribe or, or you know, you can come to us and we can train you how to adapt the Walking in Balance to, um, you know, Lummi culture to Navajo culture. I actually am doing a training in a couple of weeks. I'm going to Southern California for the Kahuya people to adapt all of these, these teachings, these wellness teachings to your specific culture. Because like I said, we have similar values, even though we do have, we are definitely distinct people. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barnes. Um, and she is going to talk about the supporting science behind these traditional cultural teachings. Yeah, so Abraham makes a really good point about how imbalanced our society's values are. Um, I think there's lots of reasons for that. <laughs> but right now, unfortunately, we as a society tend to value things like money and greed and power and like this very quick uh, acquiring of pleasure, right? Not that pleasure in itself is bad, but it's all about like, how can I get money not right this second, right? And be able to, because our society is really toxic and really try, it's, we have generations of trauma that we're all holding in our body. Um, but unfortunately, I think we've left really lost sight of the fact that our true wealth is in our health because our health affects literally every other part of our life. And it seems like to me that what we're really doing is just, and, and unfortunately in our, in our Western medicine system, this is the case in a lot of, a lot of instances, but we're just kind of helping all of us like limp along and just be like barely able to, you know, stay alive and get by while we're, while our lifestyles are really working against us, because that's how we've been taught to live and that we don't have access to a lot of healthy things and whatnot. So um, like he was saying, that's really a huge reason why we're doing this is to try to help people take their power back and change their own individual lifestyle to focus more towards wellness so that they can improve their lives, but then on a grander context, be able to start to change society as well, which I'll talk about more here in a little bit. But um, so like I said, you know, our busy schedules and our the level of toxins that we're faced with every day, it really makes us hard to be healthy. Um, for example, our, I won't go into detail, we don't have time to go into the details of all of this. And also I don't wanna be too um, fear-based, but just as a overview, right? Our food industry has been compromised, right? Water, air, pollution, like almost everything that we consume or come into contact with, there's more of a focus on how we can do this in a way that is profitable over a way that is focused on our wellness. So really we do have a lot working against us, but that does not mean that we don't have any control over our wellness. There's a lot of things that we can do that are free or, you know, in, in whatever way available to us so we can shift our lifestyle to be as healthy as possible, right? We're probably not going to be able to achieve perfect health. I don't even know if that's possible here. And obviously our optimum level of health is different for every person given our context, but we want to be able to get each other there as much as possible so that we can have the best life that we can possibly have and be able to uh, hopefully bring about a revolution in our society to be a little healthier. So 
Um, like I talked about, unfortunately, many industries have weaponized our brain's tendency, tendency towards addiction um, on such an intense level that many people would really rather continue harmful behavior patterns than let go of what isn't serving them for their health. Um, it's become a really rare quality for people to care about their health, especially in the areas I live in. I, just, I live, uh, just for context, I live in the county just south of where um, Abraham was talking about that he grew up in Stillwell and it has the highest mortality rate or did a couple years ago, right? So sim similar thing. It's, I grew up in a very unhealthy area. Everybody that I know is affected by food and lifestyle things and has mental and physical health issues. And it's it breaks my heart as well. And that's why I also have a passion for this, just like Abraham talked about. So I have heard it's more common to be focused on wellness in some other places of the country. Thankfully, not many, unfortunately. So um, the more that we can choose to focus on wellness, the more obviously we can improve our individual lives, but we also start to change the collective focus towards wellness. Of course, we do that by making it more socially acceptable because we are doing it right. And we have a you know impact on other people around us. And we start to change our industries via supply and demand. They won't continue to supply us the things that harm us if we don't continue to consume them. So um, we blame society, right, for all the barriers that we face to being well, and that rightfully so, absolutely. Um, and yet we are society. So if we want a healthier one, we all have to do our part uh, to take our health back take our power back and then that bleeds over to other people. So, and the way that we kind of look at this um, from a scientific point of view, like how, what wellness means, all the different areas, I think is best captured by this model that was put out by the National Wellness Institute. It goes over, it's very similar to the indigenous medicine wheel. And it goes over air, which is that mental energy, water is emotional, earth is physical, fire is spiritual. And then they have the addition of social and occupational wellness as well. Unfortunately, our society tends to focus on intellectual, occupational, physical wellness, which are the areas that are more likely to fuel that productivity mindset. Um, but all aspects of wellness are necessary to focus on to move into balance. So it can feel very overwhelming, though, to know where to start um, from changing to that productivity to a wellness mindset because it's really an overhaul of your whole life. <laughs> um, but gaining skills from the psychology field, such as uh, something I'm going to talk a lot during the series called uh, dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, can help you improve your overall kind of like emotional stability so that you can start to create space in your life to focus on other aspects of wellness. So in the workbook, um, there's a link to a website that helps you learn these DBT skills for free. Um, and they have short videos that are broken down into sections. So it's quick and it's easy to understand for people that don't have a lot of time or attention span to be learning this stuff. So um, also, I know that most of us think it's really hard and really time consuming and expensive to focus on wellness. That's kind of, the, I mean, think about it like people talk, think about people that are really focused on wellness shop at Whole Foods, right? You don't have to do that. That's not necessary. Um, but that is kind of what the, the stereotype is. It's like a crunchy hippie that has, has enough money to be able to do that stuff. Um, but you really don't have to do that. We, there are ways to be healthy that are um, more accessible. Uh, but because we have that belief system that being wellness or focusing on wellness is really expensive and really hard and really time consuming, we end up not trying. And then we learn the hard way that the cost of not focusing on wellness is having your life taken over by illness. I will, I won't go into this, but I will tell you, I'm a huge cautionary tale for that. When I was in graduate school, which I've been out of now for almost three years, um, I did not focus, I very much focused on kind of had to survival mode, getting things done right. Um, and working and going to school. So my health was came last and I'm still paying the price for that. So <laughs> learn that lesson the hard way. And I hope all of y'all can learn it as well so that we can move all of us in the healthiest direction possible. So that's kind of the overview of the supporting science. And then as far as practical applications, I know we are going to be a little short on time, just, you know, being able to go, we can't go through everything in the workbook, but we can do a couple things at least, but I do want to give, Abraham, um, do you have, are you going to screen share the workbook at some point? I was just going to kind of show them the outline of what's all in there. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I can go ahead and share that right now. So. Um, here is the Walking and Balance Workbook, and um, this can be yours for five payments of object. Um, but anyway, this um, is where we where, where we teach out of, and so um, this is our our logo. Um, shout out to Dr. Barnes for she just um, redesigned our logo, so we're really excited about it. Really excited about the curriculum. It's actually 125 pages. 
So we won't go through the whole thing today, but if you um, want to just share the practical application that you're talking about, there you go, Jenny. Yeah, so the way, just for those of you that's going to look through it in the future, I just want to give a little outline really quick. It goes, so obviously it's broken down into all the sections we talked about that are part of walking balance, but each section is broken down into the cultural, like an, a little overview of the cultural aspect that um, Abraham talked about, a little overview of the supporting psychological knowledge that I talked about. And then the last part is practical application. So for each section that we talk about, there are several questions and also tips um, think basically like how do you take this information we're talking about and like make it part of your life right and what are some reflective questions that you can use to help you do that that's what the point of this is so we can't go through all of it today there's not enough time um, but we're going to do a little snippet from each section so for the one today the question that we're going to focus on is what are some behaviors that you already know that you could change or would like to change that would kind of move you to more towards a wellness mindset so if um, you want to throw that in the chat, anybody, or if anybody um, would just like to unmute and um, share, you know, what is something that you are working on that you find in your life that uh, maybe is causing a barrier, you know, some behaviors. Um, I'll go first. Mine, I am still working on emotional eating. Um, I'm do good on my diet. You know, I do good and I'm proud of myself, but I do, yes, I do find if I'm bored, if I'm frustrated, you know, these things, um, I can I can do some emotional eating. So um, that's, but I am working on that. Um, Dr. Barnes, how about you? Definitely sleeping more, although that, that one's hard with busyness, but <laughs> I need more of that. Also setting boundaries about who comes in and out of my life, right? Because I, I love people very easily. I want to make friends and all this stuff, but I also do not have time. So I've had to learn how to be like, all right, I need to be consistent with the people that are already in my life and not keep bringing other people in. So, yeah. That is a good one. Yes, definitely. Um, Jim, how about you? Sorry to oh, put you on the spot there. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, I've, I've struggled with sleep for a long time in my journey. And so lately, um, I've just been doing things like, you know, cutting down on my screen time, mm. uh, which has helped a lot, but also a lot of this, you know, mindfulness practicing and reducing stress. So my head's not going a million miles an hour when I lay down. And the other thing is boundaries. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of had to do some real hard boundary making. I guess it was boundary making not very long ago because I wanted time off to go back to Oklahoma for ceremony and then to New York for some cultural activities next month. And um, I had lots of PTO and they were kind of like saying, well, we don't know if we can have you gone that much. And um, it's like, why? The place will run without me, right? And, and it's like, I said, well, I guess if you don't approve it, I'll just go and deal with it when I come back. And so they approved it. <laughs> nice. So, so boundaries. Um, no, I, I definitely hear that, you know, and that's hard, you know, setting those um, those healthy boundaries with people. Um, that's a great one. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm happy that you are able to take that time. Um, for your ceremonial way. So um, just to jump into the chat really quick. Um, let's see. Um, so Donna says, get more. Um, Shannon, taking time for me, eating lunch. Um, that is crazy. We live in a society where actually you could forget to eat because you're so busy. I actually hear that a lot. Um, sugar overload. I hear you. Um, that is definitely addicting. Um, Louise says, yes, sleep issues. Um, you know, yeah, I hear you on that, making sure we're getting eight hours sleep. Wendy says, painting and bicycling. Awesome, awesome. Um, thank you, Wendy. Gator says, not placing my worth in my job. I hear that. We're not always going to have these jobs. And if we lose it, what does that do for our identity, right, and our self-worth? Thank you, Gator. Uh, Shanoa says, starting my day with a workout. So getting up earlier and yes, emotional eating. Alyssa says consistency with a fitness practice daily with a new schedule, better sleep. 
Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa. Guillermo says, I struggle eating healthy. Um, I hear that, Guillermo. Um, Wendy says, yes, boundary setting is a must. Thank you so much. I, I definitely agree. Uh, Michelle says, I'm an emotional eating and getting more sleep. Yes. Um, and then Steve says, saying no, yes, or maybe. Um, Suki says, self-care, setting work balance boundaries and sleep. Um, Charity says, I struggle with taking on too much. I'm learning to say no. I hear you on that. I'm a recovering people pleaser. So um, I feel you. Uh, Mary says, isolation and depression keep me from getting out and socializing and exercising. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I really appreciate that and sending good vibes. Your way, the strength to get out and socialize, um, you know, even virtually, but I hear you. Um, Christina says, emotional eating, distractions such as phone, boundary setting. I started working out a few years, get healthier, and I'm doing well. Awesome, Christina. Um, Mary says, when I was involved in Native communities and their practices, I was much healthier. That is awesome. And that's what Walking in Balance we're trying to do, is to get us reconnected and get um, everybody actually trained and in, in, um, teaching this so that we can then, you know, be uh, affect positive change in our communities. Um, so, Will Marie says, eating healthier. Uh, Whitney says, spending more time in and by the water. Um, that is awesome. Positive self-talk. Yes. Awesome, Whitney. Melissa says, setting boundaries and quit being used. Um, thank you, Melissa. Um, Jim says he stopped eating lunch at his desk and letting the front desk know he's not available during lunch and won't take calls during that time. Awesome. That's awesome boundary setting. Um, and um, Charity says, mine isn't about pleasing people as much as it is about knowing no one else will do it. I hear that. Um, Mine was people pleasing, but I hear you on feeling like you're the only one who's going to get stuff done. Um, and then Jessica says, not enough me time. Um, awesome. Thanks a lot, you guys. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate all of your answers. Um, thank you so much. I really, um, I, I, that's so awesome. And so, you know, one thing I get from that is we're not alone, right? I mean, I'm not trying to take pleasure in your guys' pain, but. It's awesome to know that we're all going through this together, right? And so, um, you know, I know, though, for a fact, even just by you guys being here on this webinar, yes, you are getting continuing education credit. You could be doing anything, though. And this is actually wellness, a part of it. So, boom, we're doing it today, right? So I'm going to go ahead and continue to share the PowerPoint, and we're going to continue moving along. So, um just to get back to where I was, sorry. There we go. And so our next component we're going to talk about is mindfulness. And so with this component, we aspire to be present in this moment without judging ourselves or others. Ah, so mindfulness, I'm here with you guys, right? I'm not worried about what's going on in the next room, not worried about my bills, not worried about anything outside of me. I get to be present in this moment. That's challenging, you know? And so, um, but I'm so much better at it than I used to be. On a scale of one to 10, I am probably like a six at practicing mindfulness. But I used to be a zero. You know, I was, my anxiety always had me so worried about the next hour, the next day, the next bill, the next everything, right? Um, the next evaluation, the next appointment. Um, or a lot of times I was caught up in the past and worried about all these things that happened before and I should have, could have, would have done this or that. And that meant that I was never present for my family, for myself. And it was hard for me to, to maintain my spiritual connection, to connect with my own spirit, to connect with the creator, to connect with those around me, to connect to my environment. So, <sighs> I just get to be here today. And that's awesome. And that's a gift. But it is hard. And it does take some practice because a lot of us are, you know, living in American culture. We run, 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 right? We have places to go. We got things to do. We, you know, we don't have time for this, right? And so, but studies have shown 
if we are able to practice mindfulness on a regular basis, it will drop your anxiety, lower your anxiety, lower your, your stress, help you to feel that social connection, help you to feel connected with others and to feel connected to yourself. So, um, you know, when I would go to the stomp ground, uh, you know, my uncle told me, you know, there are two posts that mark the entrance to the ground. And he told me whenever I was very young, once you pass those posts, you no longer have enemies. You know, all of your negativity, your anxiety, your stress, your resentment, you leave it outside because our grounds are doctored there at the stomp ground. So whenever I was at the stomp ground, I felt so light and I felt so good. And I would just lay down. And I remember when we weren't playing ball or eating or dancing, it was just quiet. And you could hear the, the wind going through the trees. And at that moment, that's the only time I remember in my youth, I felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And I was doing exactly what I was supposed to be doing. And I felt really good. And I would just, I could be quiet. I could watch the bugs go about their work. I could um, watch the trees dance in the wind. I could watch the smoke from the fire without these really intrusive thoughts that I carried around with me always on a daily basis. Um, you know, thoughts about me being poor, me being ugly, me being, I was socially awkward my whole life, me being all of these things that I'm not good enough, right? And so, you know, now as an adult, you know, we, I have a lot more probably, you know, even though I feel better about myself, there are still a lot of things that demand my attention and demand my time. So it's hard when we feel like we're being pulled in so many different directions. What is the cure for that? What, what can help us to, to feel more present? And that is mindfulness. So there are a couple different ways, actually, that I practice mindfulness. Um, every day, I start my day off with a prayer. Um, when I'm braiding my hair or um, when my wife's braiding my hair, I actually set an intention for my day. I just take that takes literally one minute. Um, I, I like to take walks. Um, I'll take a mindfulness walk. Even a five-minute mindfulness walk helps me to reset. Um, I actually, part of my program, every day, right at noon, I didn't do it today because we were on here, but right at noon, I close my eyes for one minute. <sighs> I do some deep breathing. How do I feel? I check in with myself because I'm gotten into the bad habit over years of suppressing my emotions. I didn't have time to feel this stuff. I didn't want to feel this stuff, right? All the negativity, the grief, the sadness, that all that stuff, right? That the stuff that actually makes me human, I didn't want any part of, right? I got I got a job, I got things to do, things that are really important. I gotta check my Facebook. I gotta, you know, Instagram, call them a name, like, you know what I mean? And so I got into all these really bad habits. So now to pull myself out of all that, Back to the present, close my eyes at, at lunch every day. Now, how do I feel? I'm like, ah, well, um, Susie hurt my feelings, you know, so I got that. Um, I got yelled at um, by um, a client on the phone. Um, that made me, you know, feel a certain way. But at least I can take that just one minute to see how I'm feeling. And if I had a bad moment, I can reset and I can start over for the rest of the day. Mindfulness crafting, we do a lot of that. I actually teach a curriculum called coping creatively. We do basket making, beading. We make stick ball sticks, um, stick balls. Um, we even make ribbon skirts, ribbon shirts, all these things, right? Because in, in Native culture, we're taught that anything we make, we're putting our energy into, right? And so we want to have good thoughts during that time, have good energy. A lot of people will burn sage or burn cedar when they're beading just to help us get in that good space, right? In that being of good mind, like Jim talked about. And so if we're doing this on a regular basis over and over, that just becomes a tool in our toolkit and actually becomes one of our habits, one of our healthy habits and really helps with that positive self-talk. And so um, I love mindfulness crafting. I think basket making is my favorite. Just, I don't have to think at all. I just weave and it's so nice. And so um, that's a great one. Actually yoga um, Jenny and I share um, um, the love for her name's Yoga by Adrienne. I'll put one on YouTube, a five minute one, 10 minute one, whatever, and just do some yoga. Close my eyes, be present. Music, um, you know, also positive affirmations and taking a break from social media. The music, um, you got to be careful of. I grew up in Gen X where it seemed like every single song was depressing. 
And so, you know, got to make sure you're having that positive music, though. Um, or, you know, if you want to feel connected with those feelings about, um, you know, whatever, um, because our grief and our sadness and all of that, that is, is appropriate. That is nothing to run from. And so um, it's actually OK for us to feel these different ways. So, um, you know, and just so just think about what is your favorite mindfulness activity that you like to do? So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Barnes so she can talk about the supporting science behind mindfulness and what it all means. Yeah, so moving toward more of a lifestyle focused on wellness really requires you to be able to change harmful behavior patterns, right? But it's really quite difficult to do that if you aren't even aware of your own mind and what's happening in it, if you're not aware of your own emotions or connected to them, able to feel them like Abraham's talking about, you're not aware of your bodily sensations, um, and how they relate to your environment, anything like that. So that makes developing a mindful lifestyle really key to be able to change those patterns, change those habits, um, and move towards wellness. And also, like he was talking about, staying in the present moment, right? So the research on mindfulness is really vast. We found that it improves depression, emotional regulation, anxiety, stress, memory, cognitive functioning, relationships, physical health. I don't know that there's anything that it wouldn't have some sort of positive impact on, honestly. Um, it's also a really core part of many evidence-based therapies within the mental health field now. So such as like, like I talked about before, dialectical behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapies, which is called ACT, or like mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, things of that nature. So fortunately, learning how to develop a mindful lifestyle is pretty easy these days in the sense of there's just a lot of articles and videos and apps and just different resources that are centered on mindfulness. So if you want to do this, there are, it's very free <laughs> and available to teach you how to do it online. But um, there's a link to an article in the workbook that I've included that's a really great place to start if you feel overwhelmed by all the options. Um, another really great reason why mindfulness is so helpful and why it does those things that I just talked about um, with improving brain health and whatnot is um, it basically is helping you exercise your attentional control, right? So a lot of our, for many reasons, uh, a lot of our attentional control, most people's is not functioning the way that we want it to, right? It's really hard to focus on the things we need to focus on. Our attention is constantly being drawn to other things, right? Um, especially if you have uh, ADHD or autism or both of those or whatever, right? If you're a neurodivergent person, you might, or if you have anything that um, that impairs your executive functioning, basically, that means that your ability to control your attention and to control what your mind is focusing on is more scattered and is difficult, right? So what mind, what well, mindfulness in general, but also specific meditation practices do is it helps you regain that attentional control. It's kind of like working out your mind, right? So like there's different forms of, of meditation. There's um, ones that are more passive. And so this would be kind of what we think about of like, you don't have to put your, you don't have to put your hands in a, in a mood drop. You don't want to, but that's kind of the stereotype that we have. That is where you passive is where you are just allowing yourself to witness what's happening in your mind. Right. So some people will phrase this as like watching clouds pass by and you're just, or watching a train go by, right. You're not becoming those thoughts. You're just kind of watching what's inside of your mind. Um, versus an active form of meditation would be like focusing on something specific. So this may be a mantra or um, maybe, maybe you will tell yourself, you know, everything is always working out for me. And so you're just repeating that to yourself or maybe you're focusing on something um, in your visual awareness or maybe you are doing a walking meditation, which is really helpful for a lot of people because it's stimulating that bilateral movements. And so it kind of helps sync the different hemispheres of your brain. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, but all of those ways you are bringing yourself back to the present moment, bring yourself back to the present moment. And that's kind of the workout aspect of it is every time you notice your thoughts going off to something that's not helpful, going into the past, right, going into the future, um, bring it back to the present moment. And then you'll happen again and you'll go, oh, did it again, bring it back to the present moment, right? And every time you bring it back, every time you bring it back, you're strengthening that intentional control. Um, so that's why, and it, it does improve your executive functioning. There are other things you need to do as well to help support your brain, but that is definitely one of them. So, um, and you'll notice after doing that, that you'll be a lot more presently focused. So as Abraham was talking about, you know, we have this, our minds tend to get stuck in the past a lot, right? Makes sense because the things that we've been through before are going to inform how we see ourselves and how we see the world and what we think is possible and how we're going to act and all of those things, Right. But when you go through really hard stuff, that means that if you don't work to release those things, um, 
release those experiences, right? And be able to focus more on what you're wanting, then you're going to continue to do, at least, you you know, we don't have control over everything, of course, but um, we will continue to kind of be in this spiral. We're creating more of the same, right? And the way that kind of works um, attention-wise is you've got, you're thinking a lot about the past and you're using that sometimes negative information or scary information to or data experience to then project into the future. And that's, that's depression, right? To project in the future of all the other bad things that could happen, which causes anxiety. So the way to kind of disrupt that, that, that cycle um, and, and work on healing is to get into the present moment and to realize that in not all, most present moments, things are usually okay, but our mind is not okay because it's focused on times where it hasn't been okay or maybe won't be. But usually right now it's okay, but we're not in the right now. So that's where we need to be is be in the right now. Um, so as a side note, like I said a minute ago, for all of you who may be neurodivergent, especially our right hemisphere ADHDers out there, uh, you may do better with a more active form of mindfulness uh, or meditation, such as going on walks, things of that nature, or listening to music. Um, if you struggle to kind of sit still and relax your mind, it is really good to be able to practice that passive form as well, but it's really hard at first. So if you need to do more active forms at first and kind of get yourself a little bit more used to that way of life, and then maybe try some passive ones later, uh, people tend to have more success that way because they'll say, oh, I cannot, I cannot meditate. I cannot do that. You know, well, of course you can't because that's the point, you know, like <laughs> it's really hard at first, but it's just like anything else, like playing, learning to play the piano or something. It just takes practice. So yeah, as far as questions go from our practical application, the first one that we have on there is um, a major reason why living mindfully is so important, like we talked about, is developing the ability to stay in the present moment instead of mentally traveling to the past or the future which often leads to or contributes to depression and anxiety. So where do you notice that your mind travels to often that creates sadness or fear or some other emotion that's being elicited by your mind and not being elicited by your present situation? So basically, where does your mind often get stuck? So um, I would say, oh, oh, I'm not on mute. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, where my mind gets stuck a lot, uh, I'm always in the future, you know, whenever I try to slow down, uh, I just, my mind automatically often will go to what else should I be doing? And I think that comes from the pressure that society puts on us right now to always be productive, right? You know, if you're not being productive, what are you? You're lazy. And so I have to fight back against that tendency. You know, in Cherokee culture, we're actually taught that rest is just as important as work. And so if we're not resting, if we're not being present, then, uh, you know, definitely we, we can suffer from that. So, uh, yeah, I would say that's where I find challenging. Just that judgment, right? Letting that judgment go. So how about you, Dr. Barnes? Yeah, I would say definitely getting stuck more in the future than the past. For me, I get stuck a lot in a lot of anxiety of how is this going to go? You know, what this aspects of my life is going to look like? How is other people going to see? You know, I find myself there a lot and I have to become aware of that and bring it back and go, don't know, doesn't matter. The future is not my business, actually. What I have to do is just focus on right now and doing the best I can to be, do like Jim talked about, do the best I can today and tomorrow will be all right. <laughs> It is hard to do that, but it does it does improve uh, automatically floating into anxiety future reactions. Yes, definitely. So, um, Jim, how about you? Is this something that you've struggled with at times? Is being present, practicing that mindfulness in our current society? Oh, yeah. Um, I've been in recovery a long time, and, and I remember when I was new and I was... Uh, going to AA and they're talking about prayer and meditation and I had all these visions of you know like sitting on cushions and and what have you and um, I tried to meditate and this thing wouldn't shut up <laughs> you know and uh and it was really uh uh I don't know I gave up I said oh this don't work and um it, but that's that natural inclination to want instant gratification you know i want it now kind of like that seinfeld guy uh, serenity now thing but uh <laughs> um so i i really 
after that, I didn't really get into that form of a practice of meditation. And um, today, I, you know, I tend to future trip a lot. Uh, right now, my mind's on, um, oh, where I'm going to be doing next month and getting ready for that, of course. And, and um, but some things I do to kind of slow down and become centered is uh, it's it's an actual intent, you know, I guess, deliberate act to slow down and like uh, um, not multitask mm -hmm. because our brains aren't made for that. And um, pause between duties or tasks or if I'm seeing clients at work, pause between each one and not finish one and rush right to the next one, you know, and and uh, um, and just. Uh, yeah, slow down, and um, you know, I got a, I got a good story about that because um, I, I'm in in a hurry all the time. It seems, and it, and just to, uh, you know, patience, patience is something. Uh, I'm not a patient person, and um, especially when I'm driving, and um, and so. Uh, Several years ago is when I was living in Oklahoma. I think it was 2019 before I came back up here. Um, Thanksgiving. And I was living uh, about 60 miles north of where you're at. I was living in Grove. And uh, my sisters live in Tahlequah. And I was going to go see them. And um, I always go down Highway 10 along the Illinois River. And if you've ever driven that stretch, it's really windy and narrow, and you got mostly bluffs on one side and a river on the other, and no place to pass. And it's a beautiful drive, too. It really is. And uh, especially that time of year when the trees were all red and orange. But here I am, I'm going down the road, and my little car handles curves well. And uh, there's this car in front of me. And they're doing this, and I had to slow down and get behind them, and all that impatience and everything was coming up in me, and uh, and I'm getting mad at them because they're keeping me from getting where I got to go, right? And uh, if, in Oklahoma, you know, all the tribes have their own tags, and this this car said Choctaw Nation, said veteran, and it was this little elder guy driving with his wife, probably going to see their family. But I didn't have no choice but to slow down. And so I just like slowed down, put on some good, uh, I think I put on some round dance songs or something. I don't know. And I'm just driving and it's beautiful. And we get to where the highway ends and you go left to go to Stillwell, right to go to Tahlequah. They turn left, I turn right. I got to my sister's house three minutes later than what the original GPS time set. And nice. there, was my, there was my lesson right there. So now I just, whenever I feel that road rage, I guess, coming up in me, I slow down. You yeah. Know, so that's awesome. And that's something actually that we talk about in the workbook is patience. And, you know, that's the goal for me also, Jim. I don't want to have little moments of mindfulness, I want to be present in my in my life 100% of the time and that and alternatively have little moments where I can think about the future right or if I want to reminisce about the past so I, I want to kind of flip the script on that and you know have it to where I can actually be present in my life all the time so but for me to be able to get back to there I really have to start these you know just a little at a time right and so um, what are some of your guys's, if anybody wants to put a chat, what are some of the ways you like to practice mindfulness? Um, Mary said grooming her horse um, just kind of helps, right? Um, you know, being in the present um, where you're not future tripping um, that Jim and um, Wendy were talking about. Um, Steve, how about you? Um, what is something that you like to do um, what is one way you like to practice mindfulness? Uh, I, that's a great question, Abraham. And I, I in reference this uh, in the chat where 
uh, one of the things that uh, that I often remind myself and those that I might be working with is to be where my feet are, and uh, and it sort of it literally grounds me in many ways. But to just to focus on the task at hand, and and when I'm at my best, I'm usually uh, out of self and thinking about someone else or focused on someone else or something else and so getting out of self i think is is important it can be it can be a double edge too because sometimes getting out of self i i'm then avoiding maybe something that i'm struggling with or wrestling with uh, so i have to i have to be careful about that too but getting out of self being in the moment i believe my spiritual self that inner part of me exists only in the moment so mm-hmm. when I'm in the moment, I'm really in, I, I have a, I have an opportunity to be in touch with my spiritual self. My spiritual self doesn't exist in the future, nor does it exist in the past. Only in the now, and this can be this can be a really powerful sort of state if if you can <laughs> if you can create that. There's you know as Jim and others have referenced, there's so many distractions around us that mm-hmm. it's hard to preserve that time and uh, to to replicate that um, you know on a regular basis but it's a lifetime endeavor but being where my feet are is my sort of mantra uh, when I'm struggling or when I have a colleague I like that struggling so yeah thank you for asking yeah no problem thank you um, for sharing I really appreciate that so um, being where your feet are I'm gonna get that made into a shirt I like that 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 is a great reminder. Um, so Mary said, um, let me see. Um, also let's see. So yeah, Mary said grooming her horse. Um, Alyssa said, um, she's a yoga practitioner since she was a teen basket weaving and cane harvesting, processing, gardening, hiking, dancing, playing with her kids. That is awesome. Those are all really awesome activities. Melissa said spending time woodworking reclaiming wood and broken objects into new beautiful creations. Awesome. Lamette said, pausing for five minutes, watering my house plants, smoothing bubble bath or soak. I like that. You know, a lot of the classes I teach, I teach a lot of walking and balance classes for a lot of different organizations. And um, right now I'm 100% women in every single one of my classes. And they always talk about the challenge of being able to take a bath. You know, they're like, you know, a lot of them have kids and, you know, just getting that 10 minutes sometimes to take a bath. People are banging on the door, you know. So uh, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Luis says saying prayers. um, And D. Arrow says creating works of art. Awesome. That's awesome. Before we move to the next section, um, Dr. Barnes, how about you? What is your favorite way to practice mindfulness? Walking for sure. I go to the, I go to Tulsa pretty much every weekend and I go to the gathering place and just walk, hope, hopefully in the sun if it's out, but just walk outside. It's my favorite. That is awesome. So I give, you know, I have to give myself permission to take the time to practice mindfulness. So I hope that you guys can too. Maybe that can be one of your positive affirmations, right? I give myself permission to do these things. I deserve time, right? I deserve to feel well. I deserve, um, you know, time to do these things. So um, awesome. Awesome, guys. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. So the next um, component of the walking and balance curriculum that we're going to talk about is gratitude. So um, we aspire to live in gratitude and practice it daily. Daily being the optimal word in that sentence, right? So you know, for a long time, I would be grateful if you give me something and then that moment will pass. I'm not grateful anymore, you know, and so I wanted to be grateful all the time. And in Turkey culture, we actually talk about gratitude as a spiritual practice, right? I am never ungrateful. I never want to be ungrateful. I never want to, you know, um, you know, be back in that space where I wasn't grateful for everything that I had. It actually took a a serious illness for me to find my my gratitude again and really be grateful just to take three steps. You know, be grateful that 
you know, my wife would bring me um, tea, be grateful that my dogs would lay with me when I didn't feel good. Um, you know, so for Cherokee people, gratitude lies at the center of our culture. Um, you know, from the time that we awake to our last thoughts before sleep, we are taught to appreciate all that we are blessed with. This practice has enabled us to remain positive and productive in the face of extreme hardship. Gratitude is woven into traditional Cherokee culture because we have long recognized the benefits of practicing it. And, you know, that's that's definitely true. We actually have at our stomp ground, um, when we eat our meal, um, our first bite, we take a bite, kind of a little bite of everything on our plate, and we spit it out. That is one gratitude practice that we have. And so what we do by that is we are giving some back symbolically, right? And the bugs will, you know, pick it up or the animals pick it up or it composts back into the earth. Um, we do this outside. So just to let you know, um, you don't want to go to a restaurant and probably spit food everywhere. Um, that might be an issue. Um, you know, but we've always done that. And that's just one of so many gratitude practices we have in our culture. But like I said, when we got separated from our culture, a lot of us, we got separated from those traditional um, positive coping skills. So how I practice gratitude now, like I said, I start my day off every day, just a prayer of thanks. I list, I have a, I do a gratitude list every single day whenever I get into the shower. Um and so, you know, Cherokees, we have a really deep relationship with water. A lot of our ceremonies involve water. Um, and we actually have a ceremony called going to water. And so, you know, I do a lot of my wellness activities when I'm taking the shower, I do my gratitude list. When I'm washing my hands, I, every single time I do positive affirmations. When I'm brushing my teeth at night, I do my what went well list, listing all the things that went well for me that day. So I do a lot of these things around water. I didn't really intend for it to be that way. It just kind of happened, but uh, it's pretty cool. So I do my gratitude list. That really helps me every single day. I don't tell anybody about it. Um, you could actually write that list out if you want to. Take a gratitude picture. I know some people have done that. Um, on YouTube, there's a TED Talk called Gratitude 365. This lady talks about her gratitude journey um, with taking a picture every time. Um, before you eat, have the family list one thing you're grateful for. This is really awesome. And it gets your family in on it, gets your kids in the habit of every day taking that time to, um, you know, kind of look back and, and see what they're grateful for. Right. And of course, you're going to get some silly answers like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm grateful my sister's feet don't smell today or whatever. But, you know, you could also really get an insight into their lives because as I don't know about you guys, but for me, the older my kids get, the less they want to talk. So any kind of, you know, um, habits we have where we're communicating with each other is really good. And then the last one that really promotes balance is tell others in your life that you're grateful for them every single day. So every single day, it would be awesome if all of us could find one person and tell them that we're grateful for them. So I don't know about you guys, but we have one corner of our house where just laundry gets thrown there. And I guess they're waiting for the laundry fairy to come and scoop it up and take it down and, you know, put it in the wash. And it's annoying. And I get that resentment, right? I get that resentment against everybody. Why am I the, all the only one doing this? Why can't anybody else do this, right? But when somebody says, you know, whether my kids or my spouse say, hey, I'm grateful for, for you. I'm, you know, thank you for doing that. Thank you for cooking. Thank you for taking me to my practice. Whatever it is, it makes my load lighter. It really does. And, you know, in that way, it promotes that balance. So in our communities, a long time of Cherokee people, we actually practice this every single day, letting others know that we're grateful for them. Um, and so, and, you know, um, that would be awesome if we could do this. Um, yeah, and it, it really does make a difference. You know, some of the people that have changed my mood the most are fast food workers. I'm driving through, I'm having a, you know, just a tough day and some spunky, um, you know, um, worker in there with just a really nice attitude, being really nice, it would change my whole day. So that good energy, it really does matter. And in our, our society where we're moving so fast and like me today, talking so fast, you know, we're just kind of bumping into each other, you know, throughout this journey. 
And it'd just be really awesome if, you know, when we're bumping into each other, we could leave, leave each other with a good feeling, with a kind word. And so um, that's my take on gratitude. So with the science behind gratitude, uh, Dr. Barnes, would you like to share that? Yeah, so neuroscientists have found that gratitude literally rewires our brain towards positivity, and it also it improves our, our life satisfaction and a million other things, which we'll get into here in a minute, so no surprise there. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the mechanisms behind, though, how it, liter how it rewires your brain, um, if you're interested in that stuff, there's a link to an article in the workbook that talks about it, and I've also included a really great um, TED Talk that discusses it as well for those of you that have more um, auditory learning styles. So again, just like mindfulness, an entire presentation could be devoted just to the literature on gratitude. There is a lot. And we know that it helps us with reducing stress and depression and anxiety, improving our physical, mental, and spiritual health, improving our sleep and our interpersonal relationships, probably for the reason that Abraham just talked about, right? Being able to share that good energy with others. Um, lowers the risks of heart disease and it lowers the risk of substance use disorders and then aids in recovery and maintaining sobriety or harm reduction, whatever you're working towards. So um, the more that you practice mindfulness, the more you will start to realize that where your attention goes is where your energy flows. So it's really crucial that we exercise that contentional, attentional control I talked about in the last section to shift away from negativity towards what we're grateful for so that our energy stays more in a positive state. Um, we have this part of our brain called the, this is your uh, fun nerd fact for the day, <laughs> called a reticular activating system or RAS. Um, and it causes us to subconsciously seek out confirmation of our beliefs. It's basically the confirmation bias part of our brain. Um, so when we are in a really negative energetic state, our brain's going to be looking unconsciously without us even trying for confirmation of those negative core beliefs that we have, which then just fuels the negativity, right? A good example of this would be if somebody from childhood, you know, for whatever reason has a really um, negative opinion of themselves and thinks that everybody dislikes them, they're just too much, you're not enough, right? Their brain is going to be really hypersensitive to um, the way that other people, like their interactions with other people. And so they might be more apt to perceive interactions as somebody rejecting them um, or being upset with them, even when that wasn't the case, because their brain's just looking for body language and words and things that confirm what they already think is true. And we all do that. Our brains all do that. But we want to be able to use that uh, mechanism that our brain has right in a way that serves us and not in a way that keeps us stuck in negativity so instead we can intentionally start to focus through gratitude practices on what is serving us and what is going well and what we are thankful for so that then the more that we do that intentionally the more our brain is going to start to look for evidence of how things are working for out, out for us instead of working against us so it's not an overnight practice or overnight shift by any means to get the brain's confirmation bias to start working in a positive way. Um, we really have to intentionally retrain it to do so by practicing gratitude as often as possible, hopefully every day. So it's just like with anything else, right? You're building muscle, learning to play the piano. It just takes practice. Um, but over time, just like with Abraham, what he talked about with that lady on YouTube, but she did a, um, a year long gratitude journey, right? It really does make a huge impact over time for sure. I mean, I think it makes an impact pretty quickly, but definitely you'll notice the effects over long term. So um, it's important to note, though, that focusing on gratitude does not mean that we have to engage in toxic positivity or spiritual bypassing. Um, like we talked about earlier with feeling emotions, right? It's very important that we acknowledge our pain um, and, and our difficult experiences as a human. And we sit with our tough emotions and instead of trying to avoid or suppress them, I promise you that's never going to help with anything. <laughs> Um, denying those experiences only serves to keep that pain alive under the surface, um, which really builds up over time and obviously is going to cause mental health and physical health issues as well. So, and a lot of times addiction issues. So instead we can create space for kind of allowing ourselves to feel safe, to feel the full range of human emotions, um, both the good, the bad, if you want to call it that, right. Uh, the, the difficult and the easy maybe. Um, and then once we have sat with and processed that pain, we can, without becoming it, um, we can then return to focusing on what is serving us and what brings us peace. So if, however, emotional regulation and setting with difficult emotions is really hard for a lot of people, right? We haven't really been taught that. We didn't, if you didn't get lucky enough to have parents that taught you, pro your school probably didn't teach you. <laughs> so where were you supposed to learn that? Um, so if you have difficulty with sitting with your emotions, which most people do, 
uh, and being able to process them and shift out of them instead of getting stuck in them. There's a practice um, that I've included in the practical application part of the gratitude section that's called heart brain coherence. Um, and I really encourage, it's kind of long. Uh, we wouldn't have time to get through it today since we have another section, but I encourage all of you when you have time to go through and read it and practice it. It basically just helps you be able to be in the present moment and to like kind of um, ride the wave of the emotion that comes kind of like weather and letting it pass through you and letting yourself process it without getting stuck in it for a long time, which then throws us off of our gratitude practices. And it uses gratitude as a way to be able to sit with that emotion, but not be um, completely overcome in a way that lasts a really long time. So, um, all right. So as far as the question for practical application, there's a few of them in here, but I thought what would be good for us to focus on today was um, to give ourselves some positive energy is to think of uh, at least one thing that makes you feel grateful for yourself. One thing I feel grateful for myself, um, I would say I'm grateful that I accept my body now. You know, for so long, I wanted to be bigger. I wanted to be smaller. I wanted to have more muscles. I wanted to be leaner. You know, like all of these things, I could never just be happy being Abraham. Just be happy being me, right? And so I'm really grateful now that I it's I accomplished this through positive affirmations. I had to tell myself I'm handsome. Like, and, you know, I did not believe it. But I was going to say it anyway because I was determined. I wanted to. I wanted to to love the person that I am, and I'm saying it over and over, watching my hands. You know, Sam, I'm, I'm handsome. Um, I like my smile. Um, I like my gray hair. All of these things, right? So after a while, I'm like, hey, about a month later, I'm like, I feel kind of good. You know, like I'm kind of a big deal. You know, and I just started to feel it. I I could feel it. And that, you know, that rise in self-confidence, um, that just gave way to more acceptance, um, you know, and just um, now I just am really in love with self-acceptance. You guys will find once we get to the self-acceptance portion and the self-compassion por portion, that's just like, I'm super fired up about it. I think everybody should feel beautiful. Everybody should feel handsome. It's, uh, you know, you guys are so amazing. You guys are so awesome. You do so much. Um, Ah, I got to quit talking. But anyway, yeah, that's mine. So, um, Jenny, how about you? Uh, I would say probably just how much I, my capacity for love. I really love people and things unconditionally. Sometimes gets me in trouble, but in general, I think that's a really beautiful aspect, and I'm grateful for myself for that. That is awesome. You should be grateful for that. The world um, needs more of that. That is so awesome. Um, so we're going to jump into the chat really quick and, and um donna says i am good enough as i am yes you are that is so awesome thank you donna Alyssa says i'm grateful for my sense of humor and capacity to grow and adapt that is awesome and those are great coping skills right um actually traditionally native coping skills our humor and our ability to grow and adapt they have really helped us um you know uh, through adversity well, Emmett says, happy being me and that I'm breathing. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Louise says, I know that my body is grateful for my attending yoga class. That is awesome. I love yoga. That is so cool. Thank you so much, Louise. Savannah says, my capacity to be empathetic and provide an authentic, safe space for family, friends, coworkers, et cetera. Thank you so much, Savannah. Um, that is so awesome. Um, that's so amazing that you are being able to be that safe place for others. Um, that is actually very healing. Um, Chinoa says, I'm grateful for my ability to be a good listener. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Um, Charity says, I'm grateful for my ability to see through chaos. That is awesome. I'm so, that is a great one. Uh, from somebody who lived in the chaos cycle for, you know, a lot of my life. That is so important. Thank you. Um, Melissa says, having empathy and compassion. Um, thank you so much, Melissa. I really appreciate that. Whitney says, grateful for my humor when times are tough keeps me going. So, you know, that's so awesome that you guys are sharing all these things because then other people could see 
how you're practicing that particular coping skill or how, you know, you're practicing gratitude and we can all share together, right? Um, that, that I just think that's awesome. Anytime you get a group of people together, it, it's healing. I really feel like that. And so um, I'm actually being healed today. I'm just, I'm so, um, I would say, um, I can feel the love. I really appreciate your guys' answers. You know, in our world, like I said, it's it's really tough. You know, our society sometimes. Just thank you guys so much. Um, so Steve said matching serenity with calamity. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, Will Marie says grateful for being empathetic and compassionate. Thank you so much, Will Marie. Sharon says I'm grateful to possess the qualities of compassion, empathy, humility, and humor and grateful for my elder status as grandma of three young boys. Awesome, awesome. Congratulations on that well-earned elder status. Whitney says, this conversation has been so inspiring and hope-filled. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney, that is awesome. Uh, Melissa says, love you and your wellness program, Abraham. Oh, well, no, I really appreciate that. Well, no, Melissa. Um, and Jim says, I am thankful for all of you. That is awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. So, you know, and you guys are exactly right. I think a couple of you guys said it. You, It's hard to be both grateful and unhappy at the same time, right? So that's just, you know, but it's really hard right now. Um, I will say that with social media. Social media, technology are both making it harder for us to be grateful. So technology why is that? Jenny talked about it earlier, I think, um, our instant gratification, right? If people pull through a uh, fast food and you do not get your burger in um, 46 seconds or less, people start honking like it's a whole freaking deal. If You know, the Starbucks line, especially. And like, so technology, oh, my phone, if my phone doesn't load fast enough or my computer, instant frustration, right? And so Jim was talking about that patience earlier and how important it is for us to be still be able to practice that that positive coping skill of patience, even though with technology, we're, we're more used now to instant gratification. So definitely, yeah, that is something to be keep in mind. And also for social media, you know, it's hard because a lot of times you're comparing your worst to other people's best, right? They're not putting uh, oftentimes, you know, pictures of them in their pajamas and their everything, right? When people go on social media, they're like, boom, all their kids are like, look all nice. And you look at your kids and you're like, guys, Lee, you know what I mean? How come my kids are all dirty and throwing stuff at each other? You know what I mean? And so that makes you feel like a bad parent, right? And so, you know, that's one thing, especially with our young, the younger generation, we have to be more mindful about body image, telling them they're beautiful. And so how do we how do we teach that? I oft, I always thought I was by drilling it into them, right? But I finally learned it's, you know, if I treat myself better, my kids learn to treat themselves better, right? So my kids wouldn't always do what I say, they would do what I do, right? And so I could tell them all the time, be a nice person, blah, blah. And then when we're in traffic, I'm cussing at everybody. They're going to do that, right? And so now if I want my kids to model something, I practice it. And so I will tell myself, hey, you know, I'm happy with my parents. I love my body. This about myself. Um, you know, I like that. I'm kind of socially awkward. I think it's funny now. And my kids see that, hey, you know what? My That's okay with my dad. He's kind of weird. And he accepts that about himself. You know what? I can accept these things about myself, right? So I'm getting a little off, off topic, but I was just going to say social media with our young people, you know, and them, the unrealistic body standards, you know, Dr. Barnes, you um, talk about this a lot, right? Our young women, you know, they're expect to look a certain way and then they're not given the tools to look that certain way, right? With our, our food, right? And that's just so unfair. You know, like, and then they just feel really bad about themselves. So you have any thoughts on that before we go into the last subject, Dr. Barnes? 
Yeah, I wrote, I have a lot, but I will keep it short. I wrote my whole dissertation over it, right? But I do feel like that is uh, something that we're overlooking in this country a lot. I, I was thinking about my specific culture, but it's this way in a lot of, we were in just, and not even specific genders, but like we tell our the people in our society, you need to look this way or or it's not even about looks. It's also, you need to be mindful, you need to be present, you need to be calm, you need to be, have good mental health. And then literally set a, the whole society up to be exactly opposite of that. Like you're giving us Cheetos and extremely busy schedules. We're in survival mode. We're drinking soda. Like, do you really think that's going to get us there? No, but so it's, it's just being set up for for um disappointment and self-hatred all the time so and so you know my my point being that hey you know what if you do not feel good and you know we some of times we do not it's totally okay you know it's okay for us to not be okay and it's okay that we're we're continuing to work on these things this is all i do walking in balance this is all i talk about all day every day and i'm not (laughs) <laughs> that good at it. But that's why I talk about it all day, every day, because I want to be better at it. When I'm I'm at the end of my journey, um, you know, I'll just share this a little bit. My cousin, um, she passed away a couple months ago and she told me, I'm ready. I lived a good life and I'm ready. And I'm really, I'm really happy with my life. I'm happy with the things I did. And that was just blew me away. I just thought that was so amazing. I was so happy for my cousin to be happy at the end of her journey and to be ready. I just, man, that's so awesome. And that's what I want for myself. And that's what I want for all of us. I want for us at the end of our journey to be able to say, hey, you know what? I loved myself throughout this process. I healed, you know, I was able to heal from my trauma. I was able to overcome these things, you know, whatever that is. So that's the point kind of in a nutshell of why we're even talking about walking in balance, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and share, continue to share the PowerPoint. And we're going to, we just have one last um, component to share for this session. And um, we'll get you guys out of here. So boom. And then that had to be the one I want to talk about the most. Um, Self-compassion. So we aspire to be compassionate um, to ourselves at all times. We aspire to forgive, accept, and love ourselves unconditionally unconditionally. We aspire to forgive, accept, and love ourselves unconditionally. So this was hard for me growing up. I was poor. My parents were addicts. Um, And so, you know, um, I was in an Indian boarding school where I was told I was going to hell every day. We were abused. Like I was in survival mode from very early on. Lots of trauma, Um, you know, and I internalized all of that. And so, but, you know, the one thing that helped me to, to start to heal from that is my uncle would come and pick me up and take me to ceremony without fail all the time, pick me up, take me to ceremony, take me to ceremony, take me to ceremony. And that's the first place I learned about forgiveness. I learned that, you know, actually by me keep holding that resentment in, it bonded me to that negative event. It bonded me to that traumatic time. So whenever I was able to forgive others, to forgive myself, I actually released myself from that bond, from from that negative event. And so actually every Sunday we go, we play stickball, we practice mindfulness, we forgive, we can start over, start fresh. And so, you know, and so that's where I, I learned this from was actually at our ceremonial grounds. And that's why we continue to go to this day. Um, We have our green corn ceremony. We actually practice every year. Um, Jim is actually um, attending his. You know, for us, for Cherokee people, that's our our new year. It's actually, and we start over for the year. We would actually scratch with thorns, scratch on our face, our chest, our legs, our back, our arms. And, you know, we would actually bleed. And during that ceremony, what you're doing is, It's symbolizing letting everything go, starting over, starting new. And so, um, but, you know, we can do this wherever we're at. And so now I try to do it every two days. I like to do it every day, but about every two days, it's actually when I can, um, you know, I'll take about five minutes and I forgive. Who do I forgive the most? My spouse. Don't tell her I said that. But if you live with somebody, 
you're going to get on each other's nerves, right? Maybe unintentionally hurt each other's feelings. You know, in relationships, I'd keep a scorecard. I'd be like, oh, okay, it happened. Next time we argue, I want to bring this up. You know, but in any good relationship, they say it's good to have a short memory, right? And so that's what I try to do now. I forgive everybody. I forgive the person who cussed at me in traffic. I forgive whatever, because it's about me and my connection to my own spirit and to others around me. And if I hold that resentment in, it's hard to practice that self-acceptance. So long story short, um, love yourself, be kind to yourself every single day. So how I do this, first off, I have to put myself first. My wellness actually comes before everything. So I'm not saying all day, every day, but, you know, my therapy appointments, my doctor's appointments, my, um, you know, my time that I set aside to work out or do yoga, um, my positive affirmations, these little things I do throughout the day, I make sure to make them a priority because if the better I feel, the better father I am, the better spouse I am, the better friend I am, the better coworker I am. So it's actually in everybody else's best interest for me to feel good, right? Because I have more patience and everything goes good. So some ways I do this, I do a what went well list every single night. Um, I just list what went well. And that helps me to kind of feel good and, and be in a, a good frame of mind before I go to sleep. I do positive affirmations every single time I wash my hands. And so Dr. Barnes and I are actually working on a planner that is going to supplement the workbook and supplement the book. So you will have a book, um, a workbook and a planner to write in what went well today, my gratitude for today, my appointments for today, all of this stuff so you can keep track of it really easy. I forgive every day or every other day. Um, practice self-acceptance, be your own cheerleader, make sure we're focusing on progress, not perfection. And you know, recognize if you can only work out for three minutes today, then work out for three minutes today. Something is better than nothing. I'm going to get a t-shirt with that also, because I really do believe in it. Doing something is better than doing nothing because those little minutes, they do add up. And a lot of times, like if I couldn't work out for 30 minutes, I'd be like, no, nah, I'm just not going to do it today. But if I have five minutes, just do that five minutes of whatever it is, mindfulness, yoga, um, you know, whatever you can do. I know we have to kind of, um, you know, be mindful about our time. And then last, you don't have to be perfect. It is okay to not be okay sometimes. So, um, Dr. Barnes, would you like to share the science on self-compassion? Yeah. I'm really proud of myself because I could talk literally all day long about self-compassion, but um, I got through it pretty quick. So, um, Dr. Barnes? Same. I'll also do my best to go as quickly as possible so we can get to questions. Um, so it's almost impossible, as you can imagine, to move from an imbalanced life to a balanced one when you have this like inner critic that is shaming you for everything you do and everything you don't do um, that it wants you to do. So despite what our society, clear, society clearly believes, shame is not a good motivational tool. Uh, we will, it's not a good motivator. We'll share, we'll say that a lot, especially throughout the rest of our program. Um, so if you get nothing else from this, just remember Shame is not a good motivator. Shaming yourself will never help you get better. It's not going to. Um, so what does help motivate you is changing that inner critic to an inner cheerleader or an inner hype man or hype woman or hype person, whatever you, whatever word you want to use, uh, that has compassion for how hard life is and how hard change can be. So studying psychology and working in the mental health field and also just being a human teaches you that being a human is an incredibly difficult experience. And unfortunately, many of us did not get our a mental and our emotional and our spiritual needs met during our childhood and our developmental period, not because our caregivers were necessarily bad people, um, but likely because they didn't get their needs met either. And they were just doing the best they can with what they knew, right? This information has been lost, as we've talked about several times today, and uh, we our society is having a really hard time getting back on track with it. So they probably didn't get what they needed either. And so they're just giving you the best they could. So if we had caregivers who were very critical of themselves or of us or of other people in front of us, uh, we often internalize that critical voice and then we abuse ourselves with it. Um, and we ignore our context. We ignore everything that we're facing and we just think that we should be a certain way instead. It's not just our caregivers also, of course, it's our whole society, right? Just like we were talking about earlier. We have all these, we're all supposed to be 
you know, uh, thin and strong and beautiful and uh, very cognitively advanced and mentally healthy. Like we're all supposed to be these things, right? And if you're not, then you're bad and you're not good enough. Um, and so it's just more programming for us to beat ourselves with instead of being able to see our context and how unrealistic all those expectations are, right? Um, so we will believe that we aren't enough and we're not doing enough and we need to punish ourselves. I knew this was going to be here for some reason and today, but um, if any of you are Harry Potter fans, I've got this little um, statue in here of Dobby who really loved to self-punish, bless him. And we are like that sometimes. Like we, maybe we don't iron our hands, but we punish ourselves <laughs> in other ways because uh, we feel like we're not, we're not good enough, right? Uh, we're not doing good enough or we're doing something we're not supposed to be doing, right? So clearly being our lives being based in shame and lack of self-compassion is not going to be good for your mental health or your physical health because they are connected to each other. So um, this inner critic will take in any societal programming, like, like I talked about, to use as kind of a ruler with which to measure your worth. It creates standards that none of us can ever live up to, which puts us in kind of a constant state of disappointment, right? Um, instead of being compassionate and accepting towards ourselves. So while it's not our fault at all that we developed an inner critic, how could we not, <laughs> given most of our context, right? But it is up to us to be able to challenge it and shift away from it and base our behavior and our treatment on our, of ourselves on self-compassion instead of on criticism. So there's a researcher down at the University of Texas. Her name's Dr. Kristen Neff. She's done uh, an extensive amount of research on self-compassion and she wrote a whole book about it, which I talk about in the workbook if you're interested. Um, and she, she and her team have found that uh, self-compassion has a significant positive association with happiness and optimism, wisdom and personal initiative, curiosity and exploration, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and extroversion. So self-compassion also, we found, prevents occupational stress, burnout, compassion fatigue, secondary traumatization for healthcare workers. So if you struggle with any of that, I highly recommend you check out her book. Um, I also think this for me extends past just self-compassion, but also I, I struggle with it a lot sometimes, um, even though other times it can be really loving, but human compassion, right? Compassion for our entire situation that we're all in right now on this planet, especially in this country. So we're, it's rough. <laughs> uh, and so to be able to see ourselves and, and the rest of us in context and go, we, we are flawed beings really doing the best we can, um, but we need to make some changes, right? So self-compassion is not about being complacent about where you are right now. And that's not helpful to you. It's not saying like, oh, you know, all these things that I do are totally fine. And I shouldn't change anything, right? It's just being able to understand why you do what you do to love yourself, through, you know, in spite of that, to see the wonderful qualities that you have as well and balance those and to be able to say, well, now that I have compassion for myself, I love myself, I accept myself. How do I want to live my way or live my life in a way that actually puts that into practice. If you had compassion for yourself, most likely you would be more willing to take as best care of yourself as possible. Instead of if you have a lot of shame, you're probably not going to treat yourself the way that you would want to treat yourself that would lead towards health. So that's the supporting signs on that. And then as far as question goes, I know we've only got about 11 minutes. So I don't know if we will be able to answer this out loud or not or whatever, but just a prompt to be thinking about um, is what does your inner critic say to you most often? Uh, what is it kind of barking at you? And in contrast, what could your inner cheerleader or your self-compassion say to yourself instead? So whenever that's kind of what some of the rewiring work you can do in your mind, it's just being, if you have mindfulness, right? You want to be aware, be mindfully aware of what the voices in your head are saying, right? What's that inner critic saying to you? And then to be able to catch it and go, oh, that's not me. That's my dad, or that's my, you know, that's so-and-so, that's society saying this. That's not me saying this. What is me? So me might say, I'm beautiful exactly the way that I am, or I'm working hard enough or, you know, whatever to counteract that voice. So, and the more you do that, the more you start to rewire those neural pathways. So just be thinking about that. And if we have time, maybe a few people can answer. So. Um, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnes. I really appreciate that. So people have asked um, a couple of times in the chat, if we could share how they can get the workbook. So right now, um, on our website, the button isn't working, but if you want to, you can email me. And so right now the workbooks um, are $35. And so anybody interested can email me. I'll put my email in the chat and I can send you a workbook. Um, it is approximately 125 pages. 
it has all of these components. It has all of the exercises. Um, it has everything pretty much that you will need in there. Um, so um, I can go ahead and I'll put my um, name in the, my name, I'll put my email in the chat and also, um, yes, there you go. So to answer your question, Dr. Barnes, um, my inner critic says constantly, reminds me, um, very helpful that I'm not good enough. And so um, my inner cheerleader to, you know, I have to, um, you know, counter that with positive affirmations that I'm doing a good job. And, you know, I don't have to compare myself with everybody else. My journey is my journey and it is sacred and different for a reason. And we really believe that in Cherokee culture. You know, I'm going through, you know, what I'm going through, you're going through what you're going through and every everything is different for a reason. So that's... Um, that's how I kind of uh, able to counter my inner critic. So how about you, Dr. Barnes? Yeah, my office, especially in this uh, season of my life with being in burnout, um, from what I told you earlier about being in graduate school, I'm also autistic um, and figured that out not, you know, a few years ago. And so I'm in autistic burnout and that's really hard. And so it makes your, and probably other people are experiencing something similar. It makes it really hard to focus and do things that you used to be able to do. So I have a lot of my inner critic is saying like, you're, you know, you've lost your cognitive abilities or, you know, like you're somehow your brain's not good enough anymore. And so compassion comes in and says, you've been stressed most of the time and in survival mode for how am I almost 32 years, right? Like your brain's got to, and you were in a critical amount of stress for 12 years. So of course your brain's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, which is slowing down and trying to get you to just rest, right? So it's, I could go with that voice of, ah, you, you know, you've lost your mind or something, but instead self-compassion comes in and helps me to kind of recenter, so. And so to um, further um, answer, somebody else put um, a comment in the chat, to further answer your question about getting the workbook or workbook, if you want the hard copy, email me, um, you know, you can purchase that. If you just want a downloadable copy, we can provide that. So at our next training, I will get with Steve, get with Dr. Barnes to see how we can get that to you um, for the next se session, right? Because we definitely want this information out there. Um, you know, um, these are actually traditional cultural teachings that we have packaged together um, as a wellness curriculum, but we definitely want to share this information. So when you guys come for the next session, we will definitely have that um, ready, have that answered for you, how we're going to um, share that for you. Um, so, or you can email me also if you do want to purchase a workbook. So, um, let me see. So, survey. Um, yes, um, Stephen has put up the link um, for the survey. Um, yes, I will also put my website in the chat. So um, the floor is open now. Anybody want to unmute and um, tell um, me or Dr. Barnes um, what is on your mind? So Willamette says, thanks again, everyone. What a great presentation and training. Um, Shanoa says, very appreciative of your sharing of tools and today's discussion. Awesome. Wado, wado. Um, wado. That means thank you in Cherokee. Um, so let me see. The survey link is up in the chat. Um, Kim says, thank you for sharing your resources. Interested in the workbooks. Um, I will also put my phone number in the chat. So here is our website. Um, boom. There's our wellness, our wellness, there's our website, and here is my phone number. So if anybody needs to reach out, you guys have any questions about any of this stuff, um, feel free to reach out. Um, session two is next Friday. So I just want to say thank you guys all so much um, for joining. We really appreciate it. Um, it it's been an awesome experience. Dr. Barnes, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, I would just say, uh, since we didn't get to talk about it too much, one thing would be really great is if you can spend, <laughs> you can tell my therapist because I'm giving everybody <laughs> something to think about over the next week, right? 
<laughs> but if you want to think about the stuff we've talked about, but specifically with uh, your inner critic, that is a really key component to being able to move towards wellness is being able to recognize, even if you can just separate yourself from that voice, just be able to watch it and know that it's not you. If you can just do that, you'll start to head in a really good direction. So, but thank you all for being here and your kind words and participating. Awesome. Well done, um, Dr. Barnes. Jim, you have any closing thoughts? Uh, yeah, I just want, want to say about the inner critic thing. And, you know, um, you know, since since childhood, you know, the, the dominant society has imprinted upon us um, that we're that we're lacking, that we're not we're not whole, you know, and it's, you know, uh, if you look at advertising and even uh, uh, what have you that, and so I'm, I'm not complete, I'm not whole, I'm not good enough. Then you add other influences such as education, uh, churches, you know, religion uh, that was not ours being imposed on us, uh, even parents, you know, my dad told me I was never going out to nothing and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and he just told me that because his dad probably told him that. And, uh, but, um, uh, so one thing I do and, you know, I, I put in the chat, you know, would I let other people talk to me the way I talk to me? And, and I remember, uh, quite a few years ago, but I was well along in my recovery I got up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and went going through the living room, stubbed my toe on the big, my big toe on the coffee table. It was dark. And if anybody ever does, does that, they know how much that hurts. And the first words out of my mouth and pardon were, I cussed myself out. I'll just say that. Right. Where did that come from? You know, I mean, we're not born believing that stuff that stuff is put on us and printed on us you know and so i think it's a lifelong journey of practically as they say you know uh cleaning out that hard drive and putting new stuff in and so i do that several different ways like i said i set an attention sometimes it's like i will not willingly enable what i know to be a lie and that's what all that stuff is you know and other ways I do it because I'm in a supervisory role at work and a leadership role. And, you know, I, I am called upon to um, uh, train and, and lead people. And I found that by changing how I, how I talk to other people changes how I talk to myself. You know, I might say somebody I supervise makes a mistake. Instead of saying, instead of getting on them and making them feel bad, I say, you know what? I've done that before too, <laughs> you know, and this is what I learned. So that helps me too, to reprogram my mind away from that critical type of, of, you know, authoritarian kind of way that the Western society has told us to be. So. Awesome. Well, don't, thank you so much for that, Jim. I really appreciate that. Steve, you have any, um, Thoughts for us as we um, as we get out of here. Yeah, I again, I just go back to the theme. You know, when we started first started talking about this with Jim and and you and uh, Jenny is is the help for the helpers and uh, uh, the people that benefit the most are your patients or clients and and the people you're closest to when you go home. Um, so that's what I keep thinking about and. Uh, for too long, I didn't take care of my own spirit and my own self-care. And, it, it, you know, I was usually the last person to see it. So this is great, um, great dialogue. And, and I really appreciate everybody staying on with us and looking forward to session two so we can build on this. And um, we'll just keep keep moving forward. So next Friday, same time. We'll spend a couple more hours together with uh, with everyone. So hope to see you all back. Have a good day, everybody. I will see you guys all next week. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and most of all, stay connected. We'll see you again. Hey, okay. Onigia. Thank you.